Right, well, we have a good few people who have joined us already. So I make that 2 p.m. So why don't we uh, make a start, get this webinar going, and um, let me introduce my colleague, Richard Clothier. Thank you very much, Michelle. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm Richard Clothier, Product Marketing Manager here at Red Helix. And today we're going to explore how to optimize what can be your strongest or indeed your weakest defense against today's phishing and spoofing attacks, your human firewall. And we're very excited to have Javed Malik, lead security awareness advocate from the world's largest security awareness training company, Know Before, as our guest speaker today. What Javed doesn't know about security awareness training and testing probably isn't worth knowing. And by means of a quick uh, qualification, we at Red Helix have been securing and optimizing networks for enterprises and network operators since 1984. Our heritage in network security testing enables us to carefully select the security vendors that underpin our managed security services, using the latest attack techniques to hone in on the vendors and their solutions best suited to the needs of our clients. And our clients don't just choose us because we deliver robust and persistent security. They also like that we provide one invoice and one contract for all their security and network monitoring needs with the peace of mind that comes with predictable monthly pricing. And just to summarize our core security services, we protect your cloud applications and brand with app data and security monitoring services. We protect your networks with instant alerting and remediation of anomalies. We persistently test and refine network security tools, and we provide zero trust network access for secure and contextual access to networks, applications, and systems. And to protect your end users, we provide security for the devices they use. And of course, as we're discussing today, the means to train them to spot the phishing and spoofing attacks that your sophisticated security tools were probably not designed to prevent. And it's quite ironic that the cost of improving your human firewall is minuscule compared with the cost of the tools that often miss phishing and spoofing attacks. And yet, according to Deloitte, more than 90% of cyber attacks start with a phishing email. And we all receive phishing attacks every day. And here are some recent examples of emails that target some of my colleagues here. These phishing attacks pose as colleagues, companies in the supply chain, and even customers. These emails rarely contain malware attachments or links to malicious websites, and instead ask the recipient to take action that will result in a data breach or financial loss and all the damage and distraction that it brings. And this leads us to our webinar today for improving what is effectively your best or worst defense against phishing and spoofing attacks. I, know, I mentioned earlier that we're thrilled that Javed Malik is joining us and he'll be running through some key things that you can do to improve your human firewall. We're also very pleased to be joined by our very own technology director, Rob Pocock, who will be able to share some practical examples of how we see clients improve their security posture through awareness training and testing. Javed from Know Before is going to show how you can encourage a positive culture of personal responsibility for cyber hygiene how to equip your staff to spot the clever phishing and spoofing emails for what they are, and how to ensure your people feel empowered to signal when they think they've been scammed. Because let's face it, no one really wants to be the person who was duped by a nefarious email that resulted with a breach, and putting your hand up to do it can be, cannot be an easy thing to do. And in case your company is considering a cyber insurance policy, Javid is also going to run through some of the human firewall security awareness practices that qualify companies for cyber insurance coverage, as well as the ones that don't. Now, we will have a Q&A session at the end, so please do send us your questions via the chat facility on here, and I'll put them to Rob and Javad during the Q&A. And whilst there's no such a thing as a silly question, if you prefer for a, a question to be asked anomaly, uh, anonymously, that's no problem at all. Just, just mention it on the chat. And so without any further ado, I'll hand over to Javid at No Before. Thank you.
Gavin, are you on mute? I was on mute, yes. Um the start of mistake. every webinar and call. <laughs> <laughs> After two years of doing this during COVID, uh, still make a mistake. Um, but it just goes to show human error is very real. See, that was a deliberate example I, I put in there to, to showcase how, how great it is. Well, so this is my... That. This is my vanity slide. I'm just going to skip over it because I can't even say how great I am now because uh, I made that blunder. But OK, so we, we see lots of stories every day. And, um, you know, we, uh, uh, Richard just shared like some screenshots of some of the phishing emails they get. Um, th this particular one, um, it was a hedge fund in Australia. And this is one of my favorite. I say favorite. I don't mean that in an admiring way, but it's, it's one of the uh, the most uh, pointed examples where the CEO, uh, there was an invite in their calendar. So they opened it up and there was a Zoom link in and they clicked on it because why would anyone think that a calendar invite would not, would contain a phishing link? And, you know, this is a lot of it depends on how you've configured your email. And sometimes a invite comes in, it automatically gets populated into your, your calendar and what have you. So they clicked on the link, nothing happened. They thought, okay, maybe the meeting's been canceled. Uh, in the background, what actually did happen is that uh, their credentials were compromised, so criminals were able to log in, act as the CEO, send emails to the finance department to get, you know, hundreds of thousands, um, um, well, millions of dollars uh, of payment transfer to different banks. Uh, they did spot this after a couple of days, and they were able to recover most of the money. In the grand scheme of things, they only lost uh, only, I say, $600,000. Um, but because of the reputational hit that the, the the firm got, some of the biggest investors actually pulled out their money. And as a result, the fund had to fold. And I, I say this is one of my, my favorite examples in the sense that it's literally one click that caused an entire organization to fold. And, and that's quite scary when you put it in, in those terms, because there's like, you know, 30, 40, 50 people that work there. They suddenly didn't have jobs. Um, you know, there, there's there's a whole lot of things out there. Um, so, so you know, tricking people through distraction tactics is one thing or through unusual channels. I know we we, we focus a lot on emails, but yeah, calendar invites can be there. A, a DM you receive on social media, in your Instagram or Twitter or X, as it's called these days. A anything is an avenue uh, that, that people can can trick you through. Um, also, they'll, they'll pull on different emotions. Uh, so... There was the, uh, the you know, the Queen passed away and, you know, there, there's like scams like this popped up almost within within the day. And so do you want to commemorate the Queen? Yes, of course, I want to commemorate her. Would you also like to poss possibly make a lot of money by investing in this NFT? Uh, oh, yes. So there's two emotions being pulled on here. There's the sympathy card and then there's also the the, the greed card. And so a lot of people. Uh, got sucked into this so it's very easy in hindsight when it, with a cool mind to say like oh you know if something is too good to be true or you know if something pulls your emotions but it's actually in the moment that we need to be thinking about these things um, there, there's this other example uh, just a few weeks ago I came across this example there's a, a hospital in Illinois that had to shut down because a few years back they were hit by ransomware and uh, effectively, they could they couldn't financially recover from it, so they they had to shut down. So I, I think these examples of actual organisations, more than just a big financial hit, they just cannot sustain their business. is is a real scary prospect, and a lot of this occurs despite there being really good technical controls in place. Uh, because if you can bypass those controls and get an insider to take some action. Uh, then that can effectively cause uh, huge amounts of harm. But don't just believe me, believe Verizon, data, break, data breach report that they publish every year, uh, that you know, humans are, 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 are a big uh, cause of the threats. And you know, there are other vendors that do this as well. So the question then is like, if this is such a, a big problem, and we hear about this in the news all the time, and oftentimes people would be like, well, oh, you know, why? You know, be careful. Don't click on links that are dodgy. Don't don't fall for this. Why do people still fall for these links? Uh, and, you know, how can we prevent it? And I think from a defensive point of view, uh, we fall into this trap, which I didn't coin this phrase, but I, I read about it. They called it the hyperactive what, but the lazy why. 
And to, to illustrate that as a mind sort of game for, for you all, it's like, why did the chicken cross the road? And you've probably got some answers in your mind. And most of you will be restricted by the fact that you think that there's only one chicken and it's only got one reason for crossing the road. And if you limit yourself to that, then the amount of options you have as to why becomes limited as well. So if we think that people only click on a link or give up their credentials or you know answer the phone and believe some of the CEO for only one reason, we're, we're actually really limiting the, the root causes. A lot of this comes down to your company culture. It's like if, if, a, if, if a stranger walks into your office not wearing a badge and no one recognizes them, if there isn't an instance where people have not haven't just been told but shown that this is how you politely ask someone if they need help, whether they you, they need to be taken to reception or whether they're in the right building, indeed, um, you know, people aren't going to know. And and so it's not just the case of you have to tell people, but sometimes you have to demonstrate to people exactly how this works as well. The 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 other aspect to this all is, and the criminals are are very clever at at this is that our own brains actually work against us in many ways, which is unfortunate because you, you kind of like brain, hey, you're meant to be on my side, but you're not. Um, so um, it happens a lot. So a few examples, uh, many of you mu must have seen something like this growing up, uh, where depending on how the arrowheads are, your eyes begin to perceive the le length of the lines to be different. And, you know, we, we can see that these are the same length, but when you remove the, the, the dotted lines, even though you now know for a fact that these are all the same length, there's some weird trickery going on where your eyes and brain and everything is just not connecting. You're trying to force yourself to see them as being the same, but they don't always appear the same. And, uh, you know, it also works on, on this inverted T type type diagram as well. Both these lines are the same length, but, you know, uh, I, I see the, the vertical one as being longer, longer than the horizontal one. So, you know, may, maybe you do the same as well. And, and so criminals, uh, you know, take advantage of this. They know that even if sometimes something looks like a scam, smells like a scam, sounds like a scam, um, our brains will want to try and like put things together in some sort of rational way. Context is also really, really important in how they frame something to come. So, so this is where if someone picks up, if you pick up the phone and someone says, hello, I'm your CEO, that's putting a certain context around it. And then you're you, you, you're like, even if you're a bit dubious about it, they, they can then use that to frame it, their request in a way which you would take, um, you would take that instruction and, and process it. So I'm the CEO, I'm about to get on a plane, I won't be available for the next three hours, but I need you to go to the shop and buy some gift cards and and send the serial numbers to this email address. Um, and, and so many people fall, fall victim to this. And um, on, on this visual example, you can see like there's two scribbles, they look identical. Um, and so the question is, what does this scribble say? So if I'm if I'm a scammer, I'd want to try and frame it in a way to make it fit the narrative that I want you to believe. So if I put the letters A and C to either side, suddenly the letter in the middle begins to look like the letter B. But if I put the numbers 12 and 14 to either side, suddenly it begins to look like the letter B. And that's the power of framing or to contextualizing something in that way. It's why I was talking to a, a, a red team pen tester, the one, one of these people that physically go to break into buildings to show how easy it is to be done. And they were saying that no matter how, they, they do the old, two coffee cups trick where you walk up to a door with two coffee cups and so you act like you're reaching for your badge and someone would always say oh let let me hold the door open for them uh but also another thing that they do is that they say that they never wear their suit jacket they only go in their in in their shirt and he goes even if it's cold that's all he does because it gives the impression that or well, no one would probably would could have possibly come all the way here without their jacket, especially if it's cold. Their jacket must be inside the office. So our brain actually fills in the gaps that are left there, which is why we're more likely to to uh, fall victim. Another thing our brain really does, helpfully uh, or not, thank you, brain, is uh, it auto corrects stuff for us. So if we look at this uh, the, the this paragraph, it's like. 
the phenomenal power of the human mind, according to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be in the right place. And it goes on. And I can read that. And I'm sure most of you, especially if English is your first language, you can read that without any problems whatsoever. And this is why when someone sends an email to you, say, hello, this is Microsoft and your account has expired and you need to click here to change your password. Um, even if the word Microsoft is misspelt in the domain or in, 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 in the actual writing, our brain thinks, oh, the logos, the colors, the expectation is it's come from Microsoft. So therefore this must say Microsoft. So even if it's misspelt, our brains will autocorrect it and we, we will just read it as Microsoft. So um, similarly, like if I throw this logo up at you, um, you're going to read it to inter to as you know not how it uh, not what it says. You're not going to look at this immediately, and the first thing that came to your mind wasn't Coca Cola, it was Coca Cola. Uh, so that's how this works. And uh, th th part of this is down to like there's two two ways of thinking. So Daniel Kahneman, he's a, a, a one of those Nobel Prize winning experts, um, and he he wrote this book called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And he said this system one type thinking and system two thinking, which is like, you know, if, if you say like what's five plus five, that's a system one thinking because you it, you know it, you don't need to think about it. But if I say what's 572 multiplied by 736, that's a system two thinking because you can't really work it out on, on the spot. And uh, criminals want to keep you in system one thinking. They want you to just immediately and emotionally react to something so you don't have chance to stop and think about it. Um, if, if I throw this up and I say, don't read the words, but just call out the color that that word is written in, you can see how, how, how the two systems start to argue with each other. So this is green, black, uh, not blue, red, <laughs> you can see it starts to get quite difficult after a while. And, and these are the things, these are the pressures that criminals do. So, so when we, when we hear of people clicking on a link or giving up credentials, it's, it's not their fault at all. This isn't an issue of smartness or, or, or not being clever. This is just our, our own brains being used against us. And this is why, um, you know, the training is so important because it's only until you train. And, and this is what, boxers or fighters do they they repeat the same movements time and time again so that when they are hit in the face during a fight they don't suddenly freeze or crumple up or, or just cower up they know okay i've got here this is how i roll with the punch this is how i counter and, and this is why that ongoing training is so important so that you get used to to these things and you know what to do which raises the questions what do we want employees to do what do we want our colleagues to do and the answer isn't that we want everyone to become a security expert. Um, it, it's it's far simpler than that because you know we're not in the business of making everyone a security expert. There's, there's two fundamental uh, things we need to break it down to. We need people to be able to recognize when something is wrong. So or, or get that gut feel that something is wrong or a scam, and give them an easy way for for them to report that. So th this is like the first sort of category that we want. We want people to, so so we empower them and we create a culture where it's easy for them to speak up and, and make it convenient. So if you're asking people to report a security incident, you don't want that process to involve, well, phone up the help desk, press option three, then option five, then log all the details and it must be in a specific format because then no one's going to do it. Why would people take out time from their day to do that? But if you make it easy, and you you say like oh just forward an email here or click this button or or just here's a red button on your desk go go over and hit that that makes it a lot more easy and people will be more likely to report things and and the and the thing is that you if you build a feedback loop from that so that even if it's like a, a false positive you thank people for for helping them rather than letting it all go into a black hole that encourages people to report more and more so this is kind of like the first aspect the second aspect is we want people to build good habits or like have like a, a level of cyber hygiene. 
So on a personal level, uh, we all hopefully follow some. So I know some of us got a bit lax during COVID times when it was on lockdown. But, you know, shower daily, washing your hands, washing your dishes. All these things are like uh, good personal hygiene ideas. And we want them to have similar hygiene when it comes to the cyber world. So, you know, making sure that they back up data, consider strong passwords, you know, use a password vault, uh, don't overshare information on social media, um, checking the links, checking the validity of, of, uh, of, of a request. All these things are just like good behaviors and, and a base level of cyber hygiene that we want people to, to adopt. And this isn't just in the workplace, but we want people to take these home and impart these lessons with their family as well and friends as well, because that's where we 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 build up that that culture. Because every I mean, a everyone is connected anyway. So if if I want to compromise a a, a senior person at an organization, they might be fully secure. But then I could go and find that their partner is on Facebook posting photos of their kids' first day at school, which shows their their home address in the background, and the kids' uh, school uniform has the badges of of their school on it and everything. And then I can figure out, you know, that oh, they're go they're going on holiday to Switzerland for skiing in the winter and all that kind of stuff. Like, oh, the, the, it, it's so easy to find. So, so we want everyone to have that base level, so that you know, we we know, don't just protect ourselves, but we're protecting each other as well. Now, what happens is in a lot of organizations, we see like people, they they will say, OK, here's some training to to help you become aware of how to go about being more secure. And they do it once. And then people are like, well, OK, that's not worked. People are still choosing bad passwords. They're reusing the same passwords. They're not backing up data. They're still oversharing on social media, all, all these things. So clearly we think, ah. The, the, what we need to do is offer more training because, you know, as they say, you know, as they say, the beatings will continue until morale improves. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily improve. So um, I think what where we need to switch some of our thinking here is to think less like trainers and more like marketers, because ultimately we don't want to make people security experts. We just want to change their behavior so that they're a bit more secure. And if you grew up like me in the 80s, uh, you probably remember uh, marketing campaigns like this about don't forget to clunk clink before every trip. And this was on every poster. It was on the radio. It was on TV. It was the same message. Very simple. You tell them what you want from them. And then, of course, you can back it up with all the scary statistics in the background. Like, do you know that if you don't wear your seat belts, you're 10 times likely to suffer a serious injury? Or this is how many people uh, died or, or went through windscreens by not wearing seatbelts. And, and that's fine on the on, on the other side. But, you know, one could argue if someone wears their seatbelt, does it really matter that they fully understand why they're wearing a seatbelt beyond the fact that it's a it's a safe practice? Um, that's a bit more of a philosophical argument, I suppose. But, you know, the main thing I think we, we, we need to focus on is behavior change. It's not necessarily knowledge increase. Uh, you know, we, we're not trying to make encyclopedias out of people where they can answer everything, but we just want them to adopt good behaviors. And, and when it comes to behaviors, I think uh, it's a slow process. You can only change a couple of behaviors at, at any one given point in time. If I say, oh, from, from next week, uh, well, uh, as I do probably every January, I'm going to read a book a week. I'm going to start running every morning. I'm going to hit the gym three times a week. I'm, nothing happens. It all falls apart. But if I try only picking up one new habit or two at the most and say, okay, I'm going to try to go to sleep on time and I'm going to get a good night's sleep and I'm going to read a book a week, that's something maybe I can do. And once that's done, then I can start building on with another habit. And that's what we need to do with security awareness and training and all, all, the, all the things that we're trying to help people do. A good way to go about this is through the art of storytelling. And in Know Before, uh, one of our most popular bits of content is this series called The Inside Man. And it's pretty much like a Netflix show. They're short episodes, six minutes long, with a really good security message at the end of it. But people watch it for the drama for the show and the characters, and they get really invested in it. And they're always asking, when's the next season coming out? Which is really strange because no one ever asks when's the next bit of training content coming out, which is what they're pretty much asking here. So um, it just goes to show the power of storytelling. And, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, when when I go on YouTube, this I, I always end up clicking on those those videos which have a really cool thumbnail, like they show a really fat person, then they show them with ripped with abs, and I'm like, yes, I want to click on that and I want to follow that journey because that inspires me. It clearly, it hasn't inspired me enough, but you know, one day I'm sure it will inspire me enough to to take action. But this is this is what we want from people. Uh, creating nudges is is really good. So you know, nudging people to do the right thing in in the right direction. Um, you know, we see some of these examples in real life. So putting your recycle bin right next to the general waste bin is a really good design choice because people are throwing away the rubbish anyway. And then it only takes a couple of seconds to split out your recycling from your general waste. Now, in the office, imagine if you put your general waste in one corner, recycling in another and a confidential waste in the other corner. People are just going to be lazy. They're just going to pick up everything and just dump it in whatever's closest to them without a second thought. So designing your your, your systems and and your choices makes it uh, makes a big difference. Uh, for for that regard, like password meters have been proven to be really effective. So when you start typing out your a new password, there's a meter that will go from red to green or from a sad face to a smiley face. And it's been shown that that helps nudge people towards choosing choosing a stronger password. So you don't need to necessarily architect your system to enforce strong passwords, but just give them a smiley face, a thumbs up or a star. And, uh, and that's all the validation people want sometimes. I, I, I mentioned about thinking like a, like a marketer and people often ask like, how does that work or, or what does that look like? Uh, I say it's, it's quite simple. We just build it out like you would a marketing campaign. So you have like, your automated social engineering or your phishing emails that are going out on a regular basis throughout the years, for example. Um, and then you have the key behaviors that you're trying to change. You get your department heads, your area heads, your, your C-levels to repeat those in your team meetings, your department meetings, and your, your, your town halls, effectively. Um, and then you back them up with the relevant learning modules from what uh, the mods uh, like we, we call it the mod store but whatever material you have uh you can back it up with then newsletters so reinforce it have a little call out box in in your newsletter or on the intranet page you know remember always challenge that stranger for example or never plug in usbs and then you 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 reinforce it with any digital signage you might have in in the office posters up above the coffee area and what have you and this really makes it a, a very, very um, effective and, and uh, strong campaign. Uh, so the simulated phishing that goes along the top, that, that gives you a ton of really, really useful information. It's not the only social engineering vector, it's, it's by far the largest, but it, it also like gives you um, a, a really good indication of what's happening. So, um, you know, this this is based on like, you know, 12 and a half million users, this data set. So what we see is that when you first send out a phishing email to employees that haven't had any training, about a third of them on average will, will click on that or give their credentials or something. But if you follow that good campaign-based mindset and you do your regular training and, and phishing and everything, then, you know, within three months that drops down to, you know, 18%. And if you carry on, um, you know, it, it can drop down to below 5%. And and at no before, our platform is designed to be really easy and simple for you to set this up and, and what have you, but it can be a bit overwhelming. And that's why we partner with organizations like Red Helix here, who, who, who can guide you through the process of which templates to choose and how to choose them. And, and you know, you can be up and running in, in, in record time. And this is all really, really important because when you have a platform, like this, it gives you all the the compliance requirements that you need. So, especially like uh, we 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 touched upon like um, uh, the uh, insurance side of it, and, and this screenshot is from ABI, which is the Association of British Insurers, and they've got some really useful advice here on uh, improving cybersecurity and uh, raise awareness of, and off and educate employees about cybersecurity and. Uh, what the platform allows you to do is meet all the requirements there. So it allows you to educate and raise the awareness of, of cybersecurity. But more importantly, it allows you to track everyone's progress. So you can assign learning modules and that you don't need to chase people up. The system keeps track of it all for you. So you can say definitively, well, 
this person was assigned this 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 training on the 1st of October and by the 15th of October they'd watched the the, the modules they'd taken the quiz they they failed it the first time they passed it the second time they got 80% these are the areas which they they got it right and wrong in um, here's additional training we, we've assigned, and then you can show it over the course of years. So you can do this on an individual employee level or, or, uh, uh, or the organizational level. And, and so this is something that in, like not just insurers, but any compliance driven um, uh, uh, sort of like regulation uh, will, will look for these sorts of, because it needs to be evidence-based. And so you know, th this gives you everything there. So even with the email templates, you can say, look, these are the email campaigns we sent out. These are the behaviors we were looking for. And we look for them because, you know, these are the biggest risk to our industry or our vertical or, or, or our specific organization. So you can get as granular as you want in that. And and so this, this can not only demonstrate, so with your fish prone percentage on the previous slide, not only can you show to your own stakeholders like a, a demonstrable reduction in risk, but you can also evidence it all for your execs and the regulators, whoever is out there, and for insurers. Um, so, so you you're pretty tight on this area, and no one can. Uh, th there's no lee. There's very little. I say no, but you know, with insurers, you never know. But there's very little leeway for them to say you were negligent in your approach to training up your users or raising the awareness. Um, the last part I'm, I'm just going to touch upon is is security culture, and I, I mentioned it a bit, but you know, I, I security culture is about changing overall uh, thoughts and behaviors of of a group. So the security awareness that you do on an individual level uh, first raises the awareness of of people, and then eventually it gets to a point where they change their behaviors, um, and then once that moves from an individual level to a collective level, that's when you can say you're starting to affect culture change. And uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is a good example of um, how to uh, lay out a culture change plan um, because what he effectively done with the with the, with the rights movement, it's, it's a culture change. You're, you're getting people to think differently about uh, about people, uh, you know, regarding their co skin color and which establishments they're allowed in and not allowed in and everything like that. So, you know, in his famous speech, he laid out the plan. He said, I have a seven point strategy. <laughs> he didn't. No, he said, I have a dream. Uh, he could have said, I have a seven point strategy. And by quarter one, we're going to achieve this. And by quarter two, we're going to achieve that. And by, you know, this milestone, we're going to achieve equality for all. No, but he said, I have a dream because when you when you go out to culture change you're, you're dealing with people and it's not as easy as as uh installing an update on a on a system or or, or a patch you, you're really having to win hearts and minds and this is where it comes down to okay what awareness are we raising what behaviors are we changing in individuals and then how are we using that how are we leveraging those individuals to affect their colleagues and then the organization as a whole so uh for example if, if you work in an office and only one person starts locking their machine as they walk away from it to get a glass of water, to go to the printer, whatever it might be, to the meeting, the effect that has is after a while, their colleagues who sat closest to them will say, well, you know, this is really easy. I just see them. They just like bang a couple of keys and they get up and walk and their machine's locked and they come back and it doesn't really take that much time. So the people closest will start like imitating that. So when they get up, they'll start locking their machines. And eventually this will spread until the point where if someone new joins the office, they don't even need to be told that it's good practice to lock your machine when walking away from it. They will see that everyone is doing this and they will lock their machine when they walk away from it too. So, so this is what we mean by the, the culture then supports that good behavior. And this is what we're, we're, we're working towards. Um, so, so this is what we mean by creating security champions. There's always going to be one or two people in the office who, who, who are, more inclined towards adopting those secure those early adopters so if you can bring them on board and then help that leverage them you can help uh, influence the the rest of the organization i think also it's really important to get your execs to share stories so if you can get a c level exec to say like i was fished or i nearly gave up my credentials or i was fished and i did click on the link but i then reported it uh, this really makes the topic um easy to approach then. And people are like, well, A, it's not a bad thing if I get attacked because it could happen to anyone. 
And B, you're, you're show, showing that, well, if anyone gets attacked, then it, you know, as long as you report it, we can sort it out and no one's going to get slapped on the wrist for it. So that that's really important. And, and the final point is, uh, this is about uh, consistency. This is something that you need to do for, for a long time. Um, it doesn't happen over overnight. You can't just say, oh, we're going to have a six-week sprint and raise awareness, and then we're going to sit back and reap the rewards. That's like me going to the gym for the first two weeks in January, and then, you know, come October, I'm like, why am I not fit? Um, you know, so it's better to do a little bit, but more frequently over a long period of time. So that's me. I shall hand it back and then we can uh, move on to Q&A, I think. OK, thank you very much um, for that, Javid. Let me just. Uh, let me just get the right screen up. OK, thank you. So um, uh, thank you very much for that, um, Javid. That was really good. Um, we, we have had some questions that have come in um, at various points along the way. So. Um, I think it'd be good to start the Q&A, but just to summarise first, we've covered the culture of personal responsibility for cyber hygiene, equipping your staff to spot phishing and spoofing emails, in making people feel empowered to signal when they think they've been scammed, and uh, covered a bit about uh, cyber insurance coverage as well. Um, so yeah, if I just now move into the questions that we've received. So the, the first one, a very good question, um, what is the impact of AI on the human firewall both in terms of spotting attacks and making attacks more plausible. Yeah, so AI is 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 all the rage, and I think uh, you know everyone's dabbling in it, um, you know, from every angle to see how they can use it to leverage it to make make life better. Um, so there, there there is definitely a lot of um, uh, sort of like email phishing attacks that are now leveraging AI. So some of the classic sort of telltale signs were like poorly worded emails or, or or what have you. And now you can ask AI to say like, you know, you, you can do an example, say like, hey, I am the HR department at Red Helix. Write me an email that I can send to all employees saying, asking them to fill out this form. And then you put in a malicious form somewhere and it will write you a very, very good email uh, on that. So we're seeing things like that happen. And, and actually there, there's some... Uh, proof of concepts out there which are showcasing that it can actually do a back and forth conversation with you as well so you can send the phishing email through ai and if someone replies saying how do i know you're really the hr department it will actually write you a very convincing reply automatically saying oh we we take security seriously and you know whatever it'll make up some very good excuses for you so we are seeing that uh, on the attacker side um and the so while it while it makes it more easier for the criminals, the advantage is that it's still relying on the same tactics that were used previously manually. It's still an unexpected email or from either someone you, you don't expect it from or you don't know with a really strange request that is not not been asked before. Um, so this the, these are the things where like all the training that you 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 have currently is still valid and still effective. Um, and the process is still the same. This doesn't feel like the HR department would send this. Let me flag this to the security team and just double check that this is a legitimate email. And this is where that culture thing of reporting comes in. And if the security team is well equipped to to report back uh, to 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 investigate and then feed back to the to the to the customer to the reporter, um, it, that's all good. And, and that's where like we we also seeing AI coming into the fold with like some of the security products. I know say like, for example, Microsoft are integrating a lot of AI into their 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 products set like now. And um a, a lot of vendors are and we we are as well in, into some of our things. So there's a lot of technology that's going in there to help detect and you know uh, help speed up and automate the response processes. But um, I mean, but uh, currently that's largely what it is. It's just a more speed and efficiency, but the underlying principles and processes largely the same. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we've had comes in says, uh, have the risks of the human firewall increased since we've adopted more homeworking over the last couple of years as the risks have increased uh, as you weren't in the office with someone? Uh, yeah, um, I think I think the the uh, the risks we definitely saw a sharp increase um, when as as homeworking side because for for 
the vast majority of people, it was the first time they were ever working remotely. Um, and uh, so, so there was lots of phishing emails that went in saying we're from HR or we're from IT, install this new VPN. And people were installing the new VPN and it was actually just a man in middle attack. So they were then siphoning off all uh, corporate communications and, and what have you. Um, so, you know, the, it, it has increased. And that's why I think when it comes to remote working, communication is one of the key key aspects there. You need to provide people with the right communication tools. So, you know, they don't always want to raise a ticket or write an email. So maybe you've got a Slack channel or a Teams uh, sort of like channel there set up where like people can quickly type a message and ping someone and say, hey, is this legit? Is this not legit? You know, I, I, I've got a quick question about that. So it's about kind of replicating that in the office. Can, can you tap a colleague on the shoulder and ask them a quick question kind of thing? Uh, that that is what we're working on. I mean, there, there are like lots of options out there or people push some technical solutions to this, but ultimately it is a human problem and it's a human emotional condition that we're dealing with here. And we need to be sensitive of that when we when we try to solve it. Okay. So just to add to that, Richard, I, I saw some research a couple of weeks ago uh, going on from what, what Jared said about, you know, it's all in our head uh, you know, and how we think and how our brain behaves and how, how we think our brain's doing the right thing. Um, that there was some research saying that, that people are more susceptible to, to phishing messages if they're not wearing a suit and they normally wear a suit in the office. And then when they go work from home and they're not they're not dressing like work mode, that their mindset is in a very different place. Just you know, it's still 10 o'clock in the afternoon or 10 o'clock in the morning. Sorry. No, I'm working just at home. I'm not in my suit. I'm in my shorts and my T-shirt. And I'm more tempted to, to click on that link, which says click here for, for a free prize. I'd never do that in the office. But I might do it at home just just because of the mindset. That's really interesting. Um, thank you. Um, we have another question that's come in that says, "What part should comms play, communications uh, department, I guess, play in supporting this? Should a business have a comms strategy reinforcing the culture of personal responsibility when it comes to human firewall?" Um. So this will really depend on the organization you're in. So some organizations I've spoken to, they they work very, very closely with HR and comms to, to have a very tightly integrated messaging strategy that goes out and it's reinforced. Um, just because it's a security message, it doesn't necessarily mean the security team are the ones that need to deliver it. Um, you can leverage the comms team and, and HR, whoever has that, that channel and uh, and and tie it in um you just yesterday someone was was saying that they they actually tied some of their their bonuses into um their their annual performance bonuses into whether people were 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 good corporate security citizens uh, to, to, for lack of a better term so if people were reporting incident uh, potential phishing emails and what have you they they were being compensated for that basically um in some other organizations, I've heard some some CISOs say they try to avoid comms altogether because they are very like um, legal heavy and they want to you know go through everything with a fine tooth comb and sometimes they they take out the meaning or the essence of what they're trying to say so they try to find other ways of going by bypassing um, comms and this is in in. I think this is more common in large multinational organizations where you have like many different sort of like departments wanting to control the narrative. And and I think they also have a challenge where they don't want to overload their, their employees with too much information as well. So I think it will depend based on your organization. But largely speaking, I think it's it's it, if, if you can build a good relation with your comms team and HR team and uh, whoever has has a voice to to the employee, I think that that can only benefit you. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a few more questions coming in. So if we can try and sort of um, get through those quite quickly. Um, another one says, how does simulated phishing help build a security culture? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, I, so I, I, I did touch upon it and I, I, I take your point, Richard, speak quickly. That's what you just said, yeah? Answer me quickly, don't drag on. Uh, the, the, the emails, if you look at them not just as a training exercise, but an educational piece in their own right, it's uh, because when when someone gets an email and whether they pass or fail it, 
they're looking at what the headers are they're looking at those red flags and everything and if they do fail it they're more aware of what it is so it is an education piece in its own and that will hopefully have that um uh, the 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 change in behavior that we want and it starts with the individual and once we can replicate the behavior from one person to two to three to five to to the department that is what will change the the culture within the organization so it's the fundamental building one of the fundamental building blocks to changing culture okay thank you um i've got like a, a two-part question that's come in for rob um i think part two is a bit cheeky but here, here we go so um uh why would I take this as a managed service? And the second bit of it is, um, do you at Red Helix practice what you preach with this? Okay, so uh, I'll start. I'll start backwards. Uh, yes, we do. Yeah, we 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 use no before to train our own staff internally. Uh, and and interesting, that kind of goes on to sort of one of the reasons why um, why you do it as a as a managed service rather than running it in house. Um, if you're running it in-house, you've got to think about resourcing. Yeah, it's it's an easy to use product, uh, but as you saw from the campaign building, you know it's it's a continuous drip feed. So so there's there's an ongoing commitment from whoever's running the campaign or, or, or running the product uh, for through your training. We can take all those all those resources problems off of you. You know if uh, if you've got one person trained up, what happens if they're if they're ill, they're on leave, or they leave the company? You've lost that skill set. And you're starting again. So, so out, outsourcing or, or going through a, a, a MSSP uh, for for that uh, alleviates all those problems. Uh, the other thing is we can use our experience we've used from for, we've gained from from other customers to know when we're looking at the campaigns which ones really work, which ones really work with certain organisations and don't with other organisations because every organisation is different. You know, a, a big retail compared to a pharmaceutical compared to a legal firm, they have different styles of people different ways of working within them. So different campaigns work differently. And if you're running running it internally yourself, who tests the tester? Uh, I've, I've seen this quite a few times that um, it's normally the IT department if they're running it internally. Uh, and you know, some research I can quote, uh, it's the IT, uh, IT personnel who are the worst at clicking on, on these links uh, because they're, they're constantly thinking, they, 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 they know uh, what what the risks are, but they also know they're they're picking up products from all over the place. They're testing new products out, so it's very easy just to click on those links. So by outsourcing it or by going through a, an MSSP, uh, you 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 can test the whole organisation and not 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 miss out one one division, i.e. the IT department. Okay, thank you. Nice um, there we go. We've got another questions come in. Says the recent events at air traffic control have shown how risky taking shown how risky taking out a failure can be. Uh, does Red Helix help you assess what the risk of a potential breach might be and where best to invest and mitigate? Is that to me, Richard, Darrell? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. So so we, we have, as, as well as obviously um, uh, the, the No Before product, uh, we, we have many services we can offer you. If you pop over to our website, you, you can see them all. Uh, so so we, we, we like to look at the whole picture for, for an organisation. So you know, we spent the last 45 minutes talk, talking about training, um, but yeah, we, we do a lot more than that. Uh, and, and say, you know, give us a call. Uh, one of, one of our, our sales reps uh, and one of our technical team will come down and see you and we can advise you pretty much on, on any of your security aspects. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have a few more questions, but I, I, I think we're, we're running quite tight on time now. So I think if we, we go to, for one more, which is, um, how can I get my executive team on board with security awareness? Uh, bribes work normally, like, you know, cash in a brown envelope under the keyboard. No, I I, I think what it is, is that while it's a, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's framed as a cyber problem, it's a human problem and it's a, it's a risk problem. So I think uh, what, what, what's really useful is to look at, um, a good exercise, I think, for 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 a lot of organisations is um, if you go through your last couple of years worth of incidents and see what uh, and do a bit of root cause analysis, like what caused these incidents. Uh, undoubtedly, more than half of your incidents will be have some form of human error associated with it, and that I think is always when you when you convert it into a business risk discussion and say like these things are causing you so many issues, 
why i don't think any exec will then look at it and say like well we still don't want to fix it so i think going with the right data and the right approach and speaking the language that the the execs want is, is super important there was a, a there's a gentleman who's a cio at a, at a drinks company and it was a huge company and uh, he was once asked on the panel I was, I was watching he's like what's your what's your job and he's a cio and he goes my job is to help the company sell more beer and and I thought that was a, a great way of looking at it. So I, I think like when, when we approach things from a, our needs perspective, it doesn't go down too well. But if we approach execs with a like, here's what's in it for us as the, in the business, I think that then gets a lot of traction. Okay. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Um, I see that we have run over and um, one or two people have dropped off, which is to be expected, but if we could just cram in one more um, uh, question, um, please, which has come in, which is other than PPP, what other metrics are important? Oh, so the uh, fish prone percentage is, mm. is the PPP. That's the chart I showed where the, it starts off at a third and goes down. Uh, the other most important metric I would say is uh, reporting metrics, like how many people are actually reporting um, uh, sort of like suspected phishing or any other one of your security security issues. I think that's really because that really shows that people are engaged, and they they know that not only do they understand that something is wrong, but they they want to engage and 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 let you know, and and that's super super powerful because not only does it show that you've got the right culture to allow that, but also with within say like the platform uh, as well, there, there's features that allow you then to say okay this was, if if it is a legitimate phishing email. Uh, you can actually search everyone's inbox within the organization. If anyone else has got that same phishing email, you can actually rip it out of their inbox before they even had a chance to get to it. So one person reporting could save dozens of your colleagues from getting that. Uh, and then one of my favorite features in, in the product is that you can then actually take that phishing email, which was a, a real phishing email, and convert it into a template. So it's not malicious but use that as a training exercise, send it out to everyone in the organization. So, so then you see like how people would react had they received that phishing email. And then that that becomes a really, really good uh, talking point as well. So I know that's a bit of a, a dev deviation from, from the original question, but I think it's, it's important because that metric of tracking how many people report is so important because it benefits you in so many ways. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think we've run over a bit now, but uh, it's it's all it's all good interaction. So that's great. Thank you. Um, so if I could just um, quickly summarize by um, saying, you know, thank you very much for joining us today. And just to mention the uh, the know before platform that um, Javad talked about earlier and that Rob talked about. Um, we at Red Helix provide that as a managed service. Um, we can do it uh, in different ways, depending on on how your company is set up. Uh, the supported uh, level of service is that we can uh, provide it to you and configure it and we can be there to help you run it. Um, and, that's, and this is particularly good with companies that have large IT and security teams and they have the resources to run something like that themselves. But similarly, we have a more hands-on approach as well with the managed level service, which gives you everything that's in the supported level, plus we'll manage it for you day to day and we'll provide um, reporting for you for compliance and management reporting as well. Um, and that's, you, you know, uh, better geared towards um, companies with smaller IT and security teams. And if there's just one thing that I could um, uh, leave with you today, um, I, I, when I saw the um, chart earlier that Javad showed, um, when he was showing this to me a couple of weeks ago, where it shows that um, uh, based on a data set of 12 and a half million people across multiple sectors wor worldwide, based on that number, they can they can accurately tell you that if you don't have an awareness, a security awareness and training program in place, the likelihood is that 33.2%, you know, a third of your workforce is probably prone to phishing emails. Um, and yet, uh, you know, within 12 months of uh, going on a, a, a program such as this, you can get that down to uh, around 5%, which for me is, you know, is pretty compelling. Um, and of course, as, as I uh, mentioned earlier about the uh, the sophisticated security tools that we all spend a lot of money on, most of them weren't, weren't designed with phishing and spoofing in mind. So um, for the price of a cup of coffee per person per month, we can provide this to you uh, as a managed service, which we think is a pretty compelling thing. So 
Um, I'd like to thank um, everybody for joining us today and thank you particularly for your questions as well, which is it's always really good to have some nice interaction. We really do value that. So thank you. And thank you to our speakers as well, Javed Malik from Know Before and our own technical director, um, Rob Pocock here. Um, somebody from Red Helix will be following up with you shortly to thank you for attending and to see if there's anything that you need and anything we can help you with. But in the meantime, um, if there is any any questions you want to ask us, please do get in touch um, via the emails um, that we've been sending you uh, over the last couple of weeks. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>